And then I think we can start. Uh, so a very warm welcome to everyone uh, for another Wednesday afternoon webinar um, in the Go Equipped series. Um, some of you may have uh, noticed our announcement on LinkedIn that we have a change of speaker this week uh, because the original speaker, uh, Magali Haas, was unfortunately stuck in transit and just got off uh, an intercontinental flight. So she was not in the best shape to present. Um, but we uh, kindly found uh, Julia Menon, the daily director of preclinicaltrials.eu, um, uh, available because uh, she was our favorite reserve person uh, to step in and she will speak to us today about pre-registration of animal studies and I think uh, that topic might also be very interesting for you. Um, so um, yeah, Julia, uh, I think you will introduce yourself also a bit before you start your presentation. Um, I have also prepared a, a poll with a couple of introductory um, questions on pre-registration, uh, one of which also appears in, uh, in Julia's um, slides. So uh, perhaps we can start with that and uh, uh, we will have an idea of the, the existing knowledge in the group about pre-registration and you, the participants can also have a think about uh, what they actually think about the topic since it's uh, now uh, new to you and uh, we can take that along into the, uh, the discussion also later. So I'm launching a little poll right now just to have a, a baseline idea of your experience with pre-registration so far. And I will uh, um, gladly share with you the results when you've filled that out. Uh, it's only uh, three questions, uh, oh no, four, sorry. So that shouldn't uh, take too long to fill out. Um, and I'm hoping that you will share your uh, experiences, if any, with us. And if you're uh, very new to the topic, uh, also please share that because uh, then uh, it's maybe also very good for Julia to know um, that she can give some more attention to some topics in her presentation. Yes, please do. This is a very <laughs> good idea. So I'm keeping an eye on uh, the responses so far. It's still, uh, uh, they're still coming in. It's four out of 12 right now. Excellent. And I hope that you're all able to uh, access the poll. Usually Zoom is quite good with polls. <clears throat> and we're at uh, eight responses out of 12 right now. So that's uh, nearly everyone, nine. Okay, excellent. I'm already happy to see that seven person uh, in this room know about preclinicaltrials.eu. So this is, uh, this is good news already. Yeah, well, they may have taken it from your affiliation, uh, but uh, uh, otherwise it's uh, really exciting. This is possible. <laughs> I think uh, everyone who wants to vote uh, has now voted. So I will share with you the results also in the room so that we can have a little look. So um, yeah, I think uh, it's a quite a new topic actually for uh, many people, judging from question number one, where some people uh, considered uh, or did pre-registrations, but others, uh, the majority did not. Um, we have a little bit of insight into what uh, was maybe holding you back a bit uh, in uh, pre-registering your study, um, maybe uh, the amount of effort involved or uh, just a general um, uh, uh, that you did not know where or how to do it. Uh, but also a lot of people had some other reason. So if at some point, in the discussion you want to share uh, the hurdles that you encountered in this topic that is um, uh, very uh, interesting to hear um, and then uh, what types of studies do you feel should be pre-registered so uh, many of you indeed think about clinical trials animal studies uh, or any type of study so i think we're quite pre-registration minded here in the room uh, perhaps 
Uh, and indeed, um, I agree with Julia, already uh, quite some knowledge on the available platform. So uh, a lot of these uh, ring a bell to you already. And um, yeah, I hope that um, Julia's uh, lecture will give you uh, more insights into how project registration uh, works and why it is important. So we'll stop sharing this. Um, and Julia, I uh, gladly give the floor to you. Perfect, thank you. To your presentation. I will um, try to share my screen. Can you confirm that you see this uh, appropriately? Yes, okay, good. Uh, so just very quickly before we start, I would like to introduce myself, uh, even though Kim already gave me a warm welcome. Uh, so as she mentioned, I'm uh, Julia Manon. I'm currently the daily director for preclinicaltrials.eu. Uh, this is a platform dedicated to animal studies spear registration, and we will uh, talk about it a bit later today. I'm also uh, a young researcher. I do research mostly on transparency methods uh, and how they can improve animal studies. Uh, from background, I'm a biologist, but I realized pretty quick enough that the lab was not for me and focused into more uh, ethics and, and transparency uh, and the free arts in general, which led me uh, uh, to this role now, uh, which I'm enjoying a lot. So I hope uh, I can give you some sense uh, about pre-registration today, why it is important, uh, and that I will get you, let's say, excited to uh, try and pre-register your own study in the future. So what you can expect uh, for today, oops, yeah. We will have three main uh, points. At the beginning, we'll have an introduction about some pitfalls in animal research. Uh, some of these uh, topics you may have already uh, heard about or, or know in detail, but I think it's nice to, uh, well, talk about it again because it's really put in context why we need pre-registration. Then we'll, we'll move on to the second part, pre-registration and why it is a potential solution. And at the end, we will have a live demo of the platform preclinicaltrials.eu. If you have any question uh, during the uh, uh, webinar, please don't hesitate to ask in the chat. Uh, I will try to keep in mind uh, my mind on it if I can. Kim, maybe if I miss something, please let me know. Uh, but we will have time normally at the end also for all questions. So without further ado, some pitfalls in animal research. Now, I guess most of you are familiar uh, uh, with the reproducibility crisis that has been ongoing uh, for the last two decades, more or less, uh, where basically, well, we found out that most uh, animal studies could not be replicated, which is, of course, quite problematic uh, and raised really a lot of concern regarding how we uh, plan, perform and report these animal studies, uh, but also how we use animals in general in these studies and, and if they were valid uh, uh, models to mimic the human. There are a lot of uh, literature on this, so I won't go into too much detail. But if I had to summarize to some factors behind this reproducibility crisis, I would name the following. Uh, first of all, as I've just said, the validity of models. Um, are these animal models really uh, uh, valuable or, or valid to mimic the human? That's a concern that have been uh, brought up, but we won't talk about this too much in detail uh, today. The second one is the lack of proper uh, methods, not only how things are uh, performing in terms of rigor, for instance, uh, but mostly about how reliable studies are. So uh, how we perform these studies to ensure that they are reliable and produce reliable results. Uh, and I will give an example now about what I mean. Uh, let's take uh, an example here. We are doing a, a regular study with an experimental group and a control group, uh, and we give both a treatment and a placebo uh, in our study. Of course, what we want to see as a researcher is the effect of that uh, given treatment on a set of outcome measures. And we want to ensure that nothing is going to uh, influence or, or change the correlation between the treatment that we give and the potential uh, result. However, we can all uh, consciously or unconsciously introduce uh, some noises or, or some external factor in our study. And when this occurs, 
we call this uh, bias, which is a systemic error. And biases can occur throughout uh, an animal study. Uh, and I give some example here. For instance, depending on how you select uh, animals to put them into group, how you house them in your husbandry, all of these is going to have uh, an impact on your final results. Uh, also, how you provide your intervention, how you treat animals throughout the study, uh, how outcome measures uh, uh, are measured and, and detected and analyzed in the end. All of this is going to have an importance uh, on the final result. We could do, and Kim in particular, could do an entire course about bias, so I won't go into too much detail here. But what you have to remind, uh, to remember here is that this bias can normally be uh, uh, counteracted or reduced by properly blinding and randomizing uh, the study. But if it's not done, then it will create some clear differences between your experimental group and your control group uh, in such a way that the result you wanted to see, the effect you wanted to see, uh, is going to be shifted. And usually it is either overestimated or underestimated. But either way, uh, the result that you will have will be unreliable. They won't show the true effect that you wanted to investigate. And of course, that's very problematic uh, considering the amount of time, money, animal lives put into these studies. We want to make sure uh, that our, our studies are of high quality and, and provide reliable results. Other issues uh, that we can think of are usually linked to reporting and accessibility. So lack of proper uh, uh, reporting, such as selective outcome reporting, for instance, and we'll come to it in a minute, uh, different questionable practices uh, that will, let's say, make us wonder if, if the results are actually uh, appropriate and, and can be trusted. Uh, and last but not least, the lack of data accessibility. So even if a study is perfectly well designed, well performed, well reported, if it is not accessible to anyone, uh, it's going to be quite difficult to replicate it anyhow. So coming back uh, about lack of proper reporting, one point I would like to uh, um, mention is selective outcome reporting. As you may have noticed uh, uh, in research, sometime when you read someone's studies, the methodology or the result is not really well reported in such a way that you can't always understand what was done. And sometimes it can also occur that some results are completely omitted. And when this occurs, we refer to this as selective outcome reporting. Um, this happens when some results have higher chances of being uh, favored or published because they're positive or, or significant results. Uh, rather than neutral or negative data. And this is quite problematic, of course, uh, because it prevents to have a full overview of what was done. And sometimes this is even uh, worse, furthered uh, in the sense, because a whole manuscript uh, can be missing, can go unpublished, uh, simply because it has a uh, result or data which is not as favored. And I would say this is a dual thing, uh, either the editor, for instance, will say, this is not really interesting, this is not novel uh, uh, data. So researchers have trouble to publish it, or sometimes researchers themselves think, well, this is not matching my hypothesis, I'm not going to uh, try and publish it. Either way, uh, it's only showing one side of research, uh, and it really prevents to have a full overview of what was done. And this will lead often to unnecessary duplication uh, because people don't know. Uh, um, people don't know that some studies were done. They can't find it in literature because it's not published or not reported. Uh, and they will go on and do the same study over and over again, which is, of course, quite a waste. Another issue that I would like to uh, mention is questionable practices. Now, I guess most of you know about fraud. Uh, which is really malintentional and, and very harmful uh, to research. Now, questionable uh, research practices are not, let's say, on the spectrum, they're not as bad as fraud. Uh, however, they may be more common. 
and in this in this sense they're more uh, dangerous because they may seem harmless at first uh, but they can be very uh, very tricky and so for instance uh, some common questionable research practices are p-hacking which consists of changing statistical values and tests until you uh, get data which is below the p-value 0 0.05 uh, which is of course sort of uh, cheating and harking but i guess most of you know about harking uh, which is the fact of changing your hypothesis once you know your result once your results are known you can create your hypothesis instead of stating it uh, a priori before the start of the study and so all of those uh, practices of course are harmful uh, um, and shouldn't be done in proper research So I tried to give a short overview uh, of different pitfalls in animal research. I tried to keep it short so uh, it was quick and easy uh, on all of you. Um, and of course, all of these problems have been identified and several tools and guidelines have been put into place uh, to prevent them. We can think, for instance, about the prepare guidelines that you can use to better plan your study, uh, the ARRIVE guidelines that are used to better report, uh, study so at the manuscript level, open access publishing to make sure that uh, data and manuscript that get um, widely accessible to all. And so within this tendency of, of tools to, to facilitate and reduce the replication crisis, we also have pre-registration of study protocols uh, that comes into play. Mm -hmm. And we will go right away into peer registration. But if there is any question about the first uh, part, because I did go pretty fast. Are there any questions? And I will take this moment to drink some water. I see no questions in the chat, so I will just go forward from the, for now. So pre-registration of animal studies, is it a potential solution? First of all, what do we mean by pre-registration? There is several definitions, but I like this one because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, pre-registration is the act of registering research protocols before conducting the experiment. So how does this work in practice? Researchers will work on their protocol and before the start of their experiment, they will upload their document to a specific repository or fill in information about their protocol before the start of the experiment. And usually in their registration, researchers will state several information such as the hypotheses that they want to test and the outcome measures that they are going to look at, information about their methodological design, so which uh, intervention they're going to provide, which animal are going to be used, but also information about randomization and blinding, for instance. And as well, they usually provide an analysis plan to explain what they're going to analyze and how. After a certain time, or either, either directly, these protocols are publicly available. And as you can imagine, this brings quite some transparency and it also helps to reduce biases. And we will see mm. uh, in a bit more detail how this occurs. Now, many of you mentioned in the, um, in the beginning poll that you knew about clinicaltrial.gov. So I won't talk too much about this, but uh, as you know, this is the largest clinical registry. Um, it is really widely accepted for clinical trial uh, to be that peer registration is mandatory and is commonly used since 2005. And now more and more registries and, and platform exist to uh, pre-register your clinical trial, either international registries or national uh, registries. Now, if we compare this to the animal side, the preclinical uh, side, this is much more new. Um, at present, there are only two registries really tailored to animal studies. Preclinicaltrials.eu, a Dutch initiative that was started in 2018, and the Animal Study Registry, our collaborators, 
uh, from Germany who started one year after us. Now, of course, it's always possible to use general uh, repositories or, or registries to pre-register your protocol, like the Open Science Framework, the OSF, uh, that many of you might know. However, at present, um, the more general registries don't have a template or a form that is fitted, per se, uh, uh, for animal studies. A lot of the questions or the information required is linked to clinical work, for instance. Uh, so I would still advise that you use either uh, preclinicaltrials.eu or the animal study registry if you have a specific uh, um, specific animal study protocol to register. That was my poll, but we already did it, so I can skip that. Um, and now I would like to tell you a bit more about um, pre-registration, and I will use the... Uh, the platform preclinicaltrails.eu to do so. And I realized that I forgot to share my sound. So I will do that again. But I, will, I would love to show you this video, which is introducing the platform. I think it's, it's very clear uh, and will already give you a good insight of, of uh, what it is and, and what the benefits are. So just one moment. Yes, we are back on, right? Yes, no. Kim, uh, can you see Please my screen slides. again? I'm not hearing okay. anything yet. That okay. What's your question? Then I'm uh, putting it on. Nowadays, still many diseases cannot optimally be treated. Despite the improvement of many medical treatment techniques, testing on animals is often still required. With performing animal studies, it must be done very carefully and well thought through before starting. However, not all information on previously performed experiments is currently publicly available, which in part may be caused by publication bias. Journals are more prone to publish articles with positive data than neutral or negative outcomes. As a result, researchers may also be inclined to only show their most positive outcomes and ignore or not mention neutral or negative results in their manuscript. This cherry picking together with publication bias may lead to an overestimation of the tested treatment methods, leading to translational failure from animal studies to clinical trials. On top, many animal experiments are unnecessarily repeated due to lack of proper registration of conducted animal experiments. To prevent those biases, researchers can register their study protocols prior to the study on preclinicaltrials.eu for free. Researchers can access our database, where registered protocols are publicly available and searchable, enabling them to look up which animal experiments have already been performed. This way, we can increase transparency and improve quality of research while reducing unnecessary repetition of animal experiments. Ultimately, this will improve clinical research and result in better healthcare. Preclinicaltrials.eu Yes, so I hope that was uh, that was clear. Oh no, once was enough. Thank you. Um, so, how does this work uh, um, in practice? The platform preclinicaltrials.eu accepts all type of animal studies, and I will just like to explain now uh, a bit how we make this uh, happen. So, let's say you're a researcher with a protocol, uh, and you would like to register it on the platform you will have to fill in a uh, form, the PCT uh, form, which look like this. And we will go have a look at it uh, a bit later in the demo. Uh, this form really focuses on the experimental design of your study. So it's uh, quite centered and it's also compliant with the uh, Arrive Essential 10 guidelines, uh, which we hope will help you to more easily report your study in the future. And so once the uh, form is filled in and that the user is uh, satisfied with what they, they answered, uh, they can submit it. And this is uh, how the process goes. The uh, protocol uh, goes to review, administrative review, and it is sent uh, on, the, on the platform. And either my colleague or I will check it. We will look that everything is appropriately uh, filled in. 
And if we find no issue with it, it will be registered on preclinicaltrials.eu. However, if we find, for instance, that some information is missing or misplaced, or we see uh, uh, big inco incoherences uh, in the protocol, we will send some comments to the author by email, uh, and they will have the chance to make the changes and send it again. Usually at the second round of review, everything is fine and the protocol can get registered. Now, some uh, small things to note. As I mentioned, the review that we perform is only administrative. This is not an ethical review. This is not a peer review uh, uh, as well. Normally, the protocol has already been accepted uh, by an ethical review board beforehand. So we do not perform this, but we do indeed check that everything is uh, appropriately filled in. As well, once the protocol is registered on the platform, no, retract no retractation is possible of the protocol. However, you can modify it with amendments as many times as you wish. Uh, the only thing that you should know is that the different version of the same protocol will remain available on the platform. And so why would you do this, uh, you may ask? Well, there are several uh, benefits for science to pre-register pre a study. So the first one, once your uh, protocol is registered, it will, of course, uh, increase transparency by making this protocol available. Uh, in a lot of cases, study protocols are not available to the public. Uh, they usually stay uh, hidden or kept within universities or ethic committees. So that's quite, uh, quite a breakthrough already to make it available to the public. And on top of this, the fact that you have to think in detail about your study design and your protocol prior to the start of the study will really help to promote a robust study design. And as I mentioned, our form follows the ARRIVE guidelines. Uh, so we hope it also can help with reporting. Now, later in time, once uh, the study is finished and hopefully published, uh, pre-registration helps regarding certain biases. Uh, indeed, by having this registered protocol, you can really compare what was written, what was done in the end with the planned, um, planned protocol. And this will help to reduce different reporting biases. Um, it also makes questionable practices like harking um, much unlikely, considering that you had to specify your hypothesis uh, a priori. The same is true for your outcome. You had to uh, specify all outcomes that you wanted to measure. So it becomes very uh, clear if something is not reported or if something was changed in the final publication. Another nice thing that you can do uh, with this platform is that you can link uh, your result or your data to your protocol in such a way that even if the, uh, the study is not published in the end, there will always be a trace of, was, of what was done uh, somewhere online and accessible. And with this, we really hope to reduce publication bias. And other benefits that also exist for uh, other users, researchers that don't per se register themselves, but that looked uh, at the pre-registration, by browsing the platform, you can really see uh, which study is currently ongoing or maybe which study was interrupted. And this will help to avoid the duplication of uh, animal studies. And it can also help other researchers to get a better understanding uh, um, of what is being done and what has been done, which will help with reproducibility. Now, peer registration also have some personal uh, uh, benefit, I would say. One thing I, I didn't mention yet, but once your protocol is registered, it gets a, a personal, um, it gets a, a permanent, sorry, identifier, a bit like a, a DOI in a timestamp uh, that really proves when the protocol was registered. Uh, and this, this can, well, help you uh, to later on uh, refer to it in grants or in other uh, um, scientific literature. As mentioned earlier, it can help you to plan your experiment more thoroughly. Um, we will talk about this later, but you can also put an embargo on your protocol uh, 
uh, to protect your idea while still being transparent. So it's a win-win situation. And you can also learn from what people did uh, uh, by looking at current studies or, or past studies that were not per se published, but who are available on the platform. Now, at the final um, stage of your study, when you publish uh, uh, your study, it should also help you to uh, more easily report according to guidelines. And it also shows uh, a real commitment to open science practices, uh, which at least I would believe shows, uh, um, I would say, uh, reliable work, or at least that you try to have a reliable work. Now, a quick overview. Um, if we think together, who benefits from pre-registration? Well, the direct uh, benefit goes, of course, to researchers, the calling and the peers and reviewers, uh, and it helps them to better understand what is done, make sure that they don't uh, duplicate studies, help them to have a good and transparent work. Some semi-direct benefit uh, goes to journal, funders, and research institutes uh, for them to make sure that what they publish, what they fund, and what they support uh, is well, uh, well thought through, well planned. And if we go even further uh, from this, we can consider some indirect benefit to animals, considering that pre registration will help to reduce potentially the number of animals used, but also to society, uh, which requests more and more transparency in research. So quite, uh, quite some benefits. Uh, I would say, and the interesting thing about this is pre-registration is pretty straightforward. What do you need practically to pre-register? You will need an internet connection because all these registries are online. You will need a study protocol. We personally advise for it to be uh, finished, but you can also start your pre-registration with an ongoing uh, protocol, which is not uh, finished in its design. For our platform, you will need an account, of course, to preclinical trials at EU, and you will need, need a little bit of time. Usually for people that comes to us with finished protocols, about 20 minutes to half an hour is sufficient uh, to complete the entire pre-registration. And now I have a second question for you, but I'm not sure, Kim, if it is in the poll of Zoom. No, then I will just ask it to you. Uh, now that you know a bit more about pre-registration, what is your first impression? And you can, um, you can unmute and tell me what you think, or you can also type in the chat. Uh, but I would be really interested to know what, what you think. So I see a question here. Um, so is it possible to deposit protocol of an embargo? Yes, that's possible. And we'll come to it uh, uh, in a minute. And the other question is, level of detail of, an, of the existing register seems to vary in some cases. I would perhaps not be confident there was enough data to repeat. That's true, so I, I understand. Um, what you mean, is the review process also open? By review process, do you mean the administration uh, process? At present, I... Well, you can see the different version of the protocol indeed after and before the review process, um, but people cannot see the actual comment just at present, at least in our, um, in our uh, uh, registry. And it's true that the we request a minimum level of information and of detail, uh, which, as I mentioned, is, is compliant with ARRIVE. Uh, but it will indeed depend sometimes. Some people are very, very specific uh, and give a lot of details in the protocol. Some uh, really stick to the minimum. Um, and we can't, um, we can't refuse them if they do stick with the minimum that we require. Uh, someone mentioned, I tried the website in the USA and it briefly opened and then the screen went to an aqua blue background 
with no information shown. Is this typical? No, it's not typical, so that's interesting. Uh, I will put again the um, link in the uh, chat, but uh, normally, no, it's not supposed to happen, so I'm uh, <laughs> quite surprised. Did I write this well? It should be this. Um, and then, uh, would a template protocol be an idea? Do you mean um, an example protocol? Because you, you will see we already use a, a form that people have to follow, and we provide some examples on how to fill in each item, so we really try to guide them through the process. Um, and is there an effort to lobby the EU as a transnational funding agency, such as funder of preclinical trial require peer registration? Um, I would say this is in discussion. It is not currently, it is not fully currently being pushed for right now, but locally in different places, this is being uh, discussed. So maybe in the future, uh, at least I would say for confirmatory trials, uh, it may indeed end up that it becomes uh, mandatory, but for more, more flexible exploratory research, I wouldn't say that this is the main, uh, uh, for me, it's valuable for all, but I wouldn't say that the current effort by stakeholders is, is focusing on this. Oh, I see a lot of questions coming in again. Uh, maybe I'll keep some of them for later and we will um, go to the rest because I see that time is running. But I will uh, I will keep an eye on this. But good, I'm, I'm already uh, pretty happy that your first impression is, oh, that sounds awful, I'm not going to do this. Uh, because in some... Uh, Sometime in some webinar, that's what we have as an answer. So that's uh, so that's that's nice. So let's just move on for now. Um, when we ask this question, and, and I ask this question in a lot of different webinars, um, we often get some concerns from people. Usually, this can be about time. For instance, people will tell us, "I don't have time to do this." Uh, this can be about uh, flexibility and scientific creativity. Uh, people will say, what if my methodology changes? What can I do uh, about this? Will pre-registration fix my study? What about eligibility? Is my study type eligible for pre-registration? Information uh, um, about private da data and intellectual property. Uh, people sometimes can get scared that their data will be uh, taken or that their private information may get stolen. Information about cost, of course, as well. And sometimes researchers that talk with us just, well, don't know where to start. And we have thought about all of these questions and found solutions uh, to each of them. So I'll try to go quickly through it. As uh, so for people who, who are a bit worried about cost or eligibility, um, the platform, ours and, and the German as well, is fully free. So there's no cost to, to, to use there. And we accept all, uh, all animal studies as long as, uh, um, as long as animal are the prime uh, um, subject. So it can be from fundamental to confirmatory vet studies. We really take all of it. Uh, we also accept studies at all stages. So of course we encourage people to pre-register. So to really uh, uh, do the registration prior to the start of their study. Uh, but we understand that in some cases it's not possible. Uh, so you can also register your study when it's ongoing, uh, for instance, or if it has been interrupted and you want to uh, um, you want to report it somewhere, you can also use the uh, platform in that manner. Regarding exploratory studies, uh, some people are uh, let's say a bit wary about using peer registration for exploratory work. Um, and we think that uh, that is relevant for both exploratory and confirmatory work. Uh, it's always good to be properly planned for all type of research. Um, and our, our form actually fit both exploratory and confirmatory work. So uh, if you're curious, just, just have a look and uh, you'll see that it can match both. Regarding lack of time, this is, of course, a concern we hear a lot. 
uh, and we know that researchers are very busy. So we are doing our best uh, to facilitate the process as much as possible. Uh, the form in itself is pretty short um, and, and it usually follows most information required by ethnic committees. You will also find back in our form. So it should save uh, uh, quite some time. And you have to keep in mind that planning your study well will also save you time uh, in the process. I had some information about export, but I will skip that for now. Uh, regarding flexibility, uh, uh, of course, some people are also a bit worried that pre-registration is going to fix um, their protocol and that they won't be able to change anything. Uh, this is not true. The platform is really tailored to your research. We allow uh, flexibility 100%, so you can amend your protocol uh, at any time and as many times as you need to. And regarding uh, security and intellectual property, of course, this is uh, one big concern. Uh, and this is why me and the other people who created the platform took a lot of time uh, thinking about this and making sure that everything is secure, uh, safe and easy for our users. And in particular, we have this embargo that people can uh, activate when they register. So when you register your protocol, you can request this embargo and it is going to hide your protocol. Uh, it starts at one year, so it will be hidden for at least one year and you can renew it uh, a couple of times depending on your study and, and your needs. Usually we won't go over three years uh, embargo because the aim is to keep things uh, transparent, of course, and accessible, but it is possible to put it below embargo. Uh, another interesting thing is that the registration is completely anonymous. Uh, the only information showing is your uh, the institute where the study is being held, but you personally, your name is never shown on the platform. Uh, if anyone wants to see your protocol in detail, they will need to uh, create an account with us and to create an account, you need an affiliation somewhere. Uh, so in this sense, we sort of make sure that uh, not anybody can just come into the platform, but uh, researchers talking with other researchers can access the platform. And last but not least, we don't often do this, but uh, if the embargo is not sufficient, it's also possible to blind some information from your protocol uh, um, because we really focus on methodology per se. Uh, so if let's say you're testing a specific device and you don't want to display the name of this, you can also uh, blind it. However, this is going to reduce dramatically the transparency and the reproducibility uh, effect that we want to have. So that's a compromise, let's say, uh, uh, if, if it has to really be done. Oh, and lastly, I forgot that slide. Uh, some people don't know where to start with pre-registration and that's perfectly fine. We provide plenty of guidance and actually it's not that difficult. On our website, we have plenty of information, uh, an FAQ, a how-to document showing how to do things step by step. And if this is not sufficient or if you actually uh, want me or my colleagues, for instance, to talk with your PI or your colleagues or to present the platform live, all of this is possible by booking a guidance hour. Uh, which is usually done with me. And so you can book me for half an hour or an hour, uh, and I can even register live with you. So this is really, uh, we're really trying to make this as easy as possible for our users. Now we were supposed to go into the live demo, uh, but I see that it's almost 10 to five. So Kim, what do you think? Should we just go right away into questions? Maybe we should ask the participants if they would like yes. a demo or they want to look around uh, the website themselves and, and want to focus on questions. Maybe they can raise their hand if they uh, would appreciate a demo. That's a good idea. Because what I, what I suggest is if only a few people want a demo, we can go to the questions now. And I can st if that's okay, I can stay longer to give a, dem a demo only for those who wants to. Yeah, that's an excellent idea. I see three uh, 
uh, enthusiasts for a demo and one uh, uh, thumbs uh. up. So maybe we can cover some more questions first. Sure. So just uh, before we, we go to questions, some key points to remember that I hope you uh, receive from this talk. Uh, there were some issues in, in animal research that we talked uh, about very quickly, threats to internal validity, reporting biases, uh, as an example. Uh, several tools exist to counteract this, among which pre-registration that helps to improve transparency and data sharing uh, and hopefully decrease research waste. There is only a two main platform at the moment where you can do this, and I presented to you preclinicaltrial.eu, which is a safe and uh, fast and secure platform, but please also go to our German collaborators if you like. As long as you register your study, uh, we are happy regardless of where you go. And at present, it's still, let's say, rising in animal research. It's not really well known. Uh, and we, we think it should be supported by all stakeholders. So uh, please talk about this to your colleagues uh, uh, and to your collaborators. And we would gladly uh, talk with them about pre-registration and what we can put in, pl in place together to, uh, to make it easier for all. Some information uh, where you can contact us, uh, uh, but I think you have my email, so please feel free uh, to contact me and, and join us on social media if you want to uh, follow our updates. And with this, I thank you all for your attention, and I will gladly take the questions that we have in the chat and, and new ones as well. So I think we were left at, uh, at Anya, if I'm right. Um, yes, I think so. Who we'll ask, what do you think about pre-registering DAG's directed acylate graph used in clinical and observational research to enhance transparency of theory assumption of causal vision? No. Um, well, I think this is this, this can be a good idea. Um, at, at present, this is not something that we facilitate on our own uh, uh, platform, but I think with, uh, with a description with it, uh, an image sometimes is worth a thousand words. So theoretically speaking, I think that can be, could be a good idea. I'm not sure if that answers your questions fully. Um, for René, how is PCT funded and for how long? So PCT is currently funded by the Dutch uh, government, by the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, and we have been funded since 2021. We are currently uh, uh, hoping to get a second round of funding that will cover us until 2026. And we are currently uh, uh, working on a sustainable plan to be able to fund ourselves and be sufficient by then. And we will probably do this by opening our own uh, repository and, and having subscription uh, as well as sponsors and, and different other revenues, but that's uh, still under discussion internally. But so for now, we are uh, funded with public money. Ah, amazing, Kim. You sent the link and it worked. Thank you. Uh, is this initiative linked to other efforts regarding data management, metadata, also quality management, uh, such as equipped? Um, well, I would say yes and no. Uh, um, we are related locally in a sense, but we don't per se work actively, um, at least not with equipped, not to my knowledge. Uh, Kim, if you have a comment about this. Well, you're here, so that's already <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> right, an, right. Uh, an advantage. <laughs> well, that's I, right, that's I, right. I think it's, it's part, uh, we mentioned in the toolbox, uh, I think as a as a as a way of also preventing uh, bias and so i mean it's uh, it's intricately uh, linked uh, to good research sure. practice so and, I, and then i think that's that counts already for something that's right that's right yeah, yeah indeed indeed uh okay more things coming up from my point of view, I think raising awareness among scientists in both academia and industry and convincing them of leaving their ego bride aside and pre-register their project is the most critical point. Are there such efforts to reach everyone and do you see a light in the end of the tunnel? I mean, not being afraid of negative neutral result. 
Uh, that's indeed quite difficult. I think at present, uh, um, the, the people that we have registering here are mostly people who are potentially already convinced by the, the process. Uh, but we are trying at least to, to reach out to as many people as possible and create as many incentives as possible with different stakeholders. Um, for now, mostly locally, but looking at funders, for instance, different journals uh, um, that can try to push this. We also talk with ethic committees, try to get uh, uh, their influence and their help on the topic. Um, we do have some partner in industry who are in favor of this. But it is true that due to the whole patent uh, uh, um, side of things, it is quite difficult to, to convince everybody. And a lot of researchers are still very protective of their project and, and, and their data. So that's, uh, I would say I'm pretty optimistic and I see a lot of changes little bit by little bit, but it's taking a lot of, uh, a lot of time. And indeed regarding negative and, and neutral results, uh, uh, I think it's it's a real um, mindset change that we need to have that uh, a lot of people still see neutral negative result as not valuable, uh, which is not true, I believe. I think they can be very valuable, actually. Uh, and I really hope with this platform that we can also put that forward uh, and give a space for this negative or neutral data uh, and make sure that they don't get lost. Because I find it such a pity that uh, we just duplicate over and over again uh, the same the same result and uh, uh, not learn from it. Um, oh yeah, this is you, Kim. <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna read you. Uh, I think this is a good comment. I think this is what Equips also tries to do: advocate the importance of peer registration and preclinical trials that you facilitate this greatly, as it is a place where you can go to register. Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree. And yeah, um, I, I would add that indeed a couple of years uh, before now, the most common heard argument uh, against pre-registration would be, but there's no place where you can do it. Uh, so that is, uh, uh, yeah, it was not that it was completely unknown, but there just was no facility where you could put your protocol for animal studies. And now there are several. So that hurdle has been uh, crossed. Yeah, and that's a very good uh, that's a very good point. And I'll admit that's also uh, one thing I like about this platform, that it was really brought by researchers for researchers, and the people within the steering committee, uh, Kim included, uh, right here. Uh, I think you well, I wasn't there when this happened, but I guess you realized well, this is not happening. Uh, we don't have a place to do this. Why don't we create it ourselves? Um, I find this very nice for this project and, and how it turned out. Yes, this is, this is exactly uh, how it went. <laughs> yeah, and I, I like I like this uh, mindset as well. It's not there. Why don't we just create it? And do we have any other questions about the process or about the, the platform? I see, uh, René, you have your um, hands up. Please yeah. go on. Yeah, um, it's it, it's more of a comment than 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 a question, but maybe even a business advice I would give. Okay, to, that's fine. To you. Okay, so I mean the, the the problem is that that I think there are a lot more researchers out there that really would like to do this, but uh, and and are also convinced of these because this happens when I talk to people. But in the end, don't do this because the, the, the effort is just too large. And you can look at the numbers. Uh, researchers will do anything that's relatively easy, like uh, switching to open access. You know, you, you, you just switch the journal. Or you, uh, uh, you put out your manuscript and load it up to a preprint server. Relatively easy. People do it. Okay? So and when they see the benefits. On the other hand, things that are cumbersome, where they have to sort of like have questions and they have to fill out uh, lots of, 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 of fields and also tedious work, such as uh, data management plans or uh, preparing data for, uh, um, for uh, publishing in repositories. This is just too much, and even though people are convinced they don't do this. So 
my suggestion is that the um, the change needs to happen at the uh, uh, PCT levels. And I tell you how I would do this. I okay. would start to look into these large language modules because I think they can really help you uh, because a lot of the information is already out there. For instance, in the um, animal uh, um, uh, ethics forms. So use large language modules actually to ask the right questions, you know, and then you can actually already start with experiment extracting information and put them in there. And yeah. I think if this happens and this would reduce the load or you could have some sort of mandatory questions and then some extra questions, you could have maybe a two tiered registration or something like this, sort of like um, a basic and an advanced or something like this and, and, and start with this to make things easier for the researcher. Well, I'm really glad you brought that up because I thought I had no time to mention this in the presentation, but you brought it to me uh, on a silver platter, so that's perfect. We actually have this already uh, um, for mm -hmm. two programs used in the Netherlands. Yeah. Uh, one of them is PRIS, one of them is Iventureless. Uh, for PRIS, we had to work with them to add initial questions to their uh, software. Mm -hmm. This is a software that the animal welfare body use, uh, and the researchers have by by default, they have to fill in that information for the ethic committee anyhow. Uh, but so now it's, it's placed in such a way that they will fill in their regular information. They will export that mm -hmm. into a file and this file they can just directly upload into PCT. Yeah. So that's done. Uh, but we actually made better and this is still in piloting uh, phase. But for Iventionless, um, they actually wanted to align with us uh, to the maximum. Mm -hmm. And this is done in such a way now that you only click, uh, you have to click export from the researcher side. It asks you, do you want an embargo? You can say yes or no. Um, you have to tick a box for accuracy still in the software, in the original software. And this send it right away to us. So it literally takes five to 10 seconds to pay register in that case. Mm -hmm. um, so this isn't piloting at the moment. Because of course, this requires quite some coordination from the different yeah. software and, and the language, but we are trying to develop this uh, uh, more and more. And beside this, we are trying to get to, to um, other software like Ticket Labs, uh, uh, for instance. And, and one, one of the big exports we're hoping to do now, and we're experimenting with this as well. Uh, we are working with the French Free R Center uh, it's very co convenient because they have one platform for the entire country. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, uh, as we have in the Netherlands, we have one software per uh, ethic committee, sort of, which is a little bit uh, cumbersome at time. Here, they have one platform, and, and we are trying to do a similar export that also translates to English. Yeah. Uh, and if that works well, because right now we're using AI to do this, and it's working mm -hmm. pretty well, uh, we hope to... Uh, uh, have this for other languages as well. Yeah, because I mean that's that's one of the barriers that that every country has their Definitely, own yeah, language yeah. and and uh, and research, and uh, that's an enormous barrier for for the, the yes, the that's, that's true. No, that, that's true. That's true, and, and and this is one of our main uh, let's say main activity. We promote things, we research things, and we facilitate. That's the three things that we do. Uh, and facilitation is really something we, we try to work on, but it does take time. Uh, uh, and and, and sometimes it's not even that the, um, that the researchers don't want to do it, it's the softwares who are not interested mm -hmm. into developing it. Yeah. Uh, so that also comes both ways, uh, um, which, which I think is interesting because uh, for some of them, the, the users are basically bringing back, oh, we would love such a, such a function to uh, exist. And then the software say, well, no, we don't see the use of that yet. Uh, so I think we also need a change in mindset regarding uh, how we see pre-registration for animal studies. But I agree, uh, facilitating the, the, the process in itself, if we can do this uh, long term uh, and easily, that would, be, that would be the best. So that was a very good, good, very good feedback. Thank you. Yeah, sure. No, glad you're already on this. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm not the one who started it, but I'm trying to lead it as much as I can. Uh, I see one question for uh, from Marte uh, about the shoot, especially when it comes to publicly funded research. Do you think it should become a must? 
Um, well, if I'm thinking, if I'm answering from my own personal belief, yes, I would say yes. Uh, but I mean, maybe I'm a bit biased because I'm really pro pre-registration. I think this is an amazing tool. Not everybody would uh, agree with me, but but I think it would be would be valuable. Isn't time exactly the thing that is lacking in the super competitive academic fields? Yes, I'm afraid this is the time. Uh, this is the thing that is lacking the most indeed. Uh, uh, and actually, th this is the two things that, that I think are holding people the most, or the three things that are holding people the most back is they have no time to do this, or they think this is going to be too tedious. Um, then you have people concerned about uh, uh, getting scooped, the privacy of their data, uh, how this is going to go, even though we do have an embargo and other uh, measures, this is never enough. Uh, um, and and um, I said three. And the third one is the lack of incentive and motivation, uh, at least for animal studies right now. Uh, there is no uh, um, big demand, for instance, of journals to make this mandatory. There is no demands of, of funders. We try to uh, spark this uh, around this little bit by little bit, and we see more and more funders, for instance, recommend it. Uh, but making things mandatory is taking a lot of time. With one of the uh, main funder in the Netherlands, we are doing this pilot with them, where they are trying to make uh, pre-registration mandatory and, and see how they can incorporate it in their system, how they could check that this is uh, being done. Uh, but I think we, we need a bit more time for everything to be uh, smooth and running. At least we have seen that having must is what got pre-registration moving so much faster for clinical studies. This is true. I mean, since 2005 and the journal medical editor started to say you have to do it and everybody started doing it. That's, uh, that's correct. Thank do we have... Much, Julia. Um, sure. I'm just keeping keeping a, a little eye on the clock um, yes. because it's uh, five minutes past five. Uh, I guess that some people um, may uh, have other um, appointments that they still need to get to. So if um, most questions have been answered, then uh, I suggest that uh, I thank Julia again for um, stepping in like really last minute uh, as our speaker today. And I thought uh, it was very uh, nice presentation and I even Thank learned still, uh, things from it uh, oh. <laughs> again. Um, you uh, have kindly offered to stay on a bit for a yes. demonstration of the platform. So um, I suggest that everyone who wants to stay on uh, stays and otherwise we won't uh, uh, hold it against you if you have to leave right now. But we do hope, of course, to see you again in two weeks when uh, Magali Haas, uh, who was originally planned to speak today, will um, tell us about her, uh, an industry perspective of um, the equipped quality system. So hope to see you.